Hello, my name is Nicole Mashburn and I'm one of the physiology instructors here at Calhoun. And today I'm going to talk to you about brain function and anatomy. So let's get started. And the first thing we need to talk about when we talk about the brain is its protection. We know that the brain is located inside the cranial cavity. And there's basically four layers of protection. You have the bony layer. So you've got your scalp and muscle, and you have this bony layer, okay? Then you've got three layers of meninges. And meninges is just a fancy word for membranes. You have the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. And these are the meninges right through here. Dura mater is the tough layer, as in durable. Okay, so the tough or durable, uh, dur durable layer. When you get in lab, if you do the sheet brain dissection, you'll cut through the dura mater, you will see just how, how tough that layer is. The arachnoid layer, arachnoid, as in spider, is the layer that contains the blood vessel, so it looks like a spider's web. And in the innermost layer, called the pia mater, and pia actually means tender, and I tell my class to think of the word like cuddly, the cuddly mother. It's the layer that's right up, cuddling right up on the brain, so it's the innermost layer. It's real thin, it's really hard to see on the sheep brain, but you will see the dura mater and the arachnoid mater for sure when you do that dissection. So these three layers basically make a sac that the brain sits in. The brain's enclosed in this sac. Now inside that sac you have a watery fluid called the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. A lot of times you'll see that abbreviated as CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. And that cerebrospinal fluid just allows the brain to sort of float inside, inside the uh, cranial cavity. Then you also have a physical barrier called the blood-brain barrier that allows some substances to cross from the blood to the brain and, and back from the brain to the blood. And it blocks the uh, passage of some things. Now, alcohol, nicotine, and anesthetics are allowed to pass the blood-brain barrier, and that's why you get that buzzed feeling um, after you drink a, a beer or a glass of wine, something like that. Now, this is a sagittal uh, cut of the, uh, of, the, of the head, and we've got our brain. So we have our layers, and then we have our three main parts of the brain. I'm going to point those out to you just real quick. You have your cerebrum, your cerebellum, and your brainstem. Okay. Now, the, the uh, cerebrum is floating up inside. There's the CSF. This blue stuff is the cerebrospinal fluid. And you've got your meninges. And you've got the brain just floating in this fluid. This area here is called the choroid plexus, and it's actually what makes the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is made here, and then it flows around the brain and into the ventricles, or these spaces inside the brain. Now, we're going to talk about some specific anatomy of the brain. If you've already covered the bones, which you should have by now, some of these words are going to start to look really familiar. When you look at the cerebrum, this main big part of the brain, it's got four lobes. A frontal lobe, just like the frontal bone of the skull. A parietal lobe, just like the parietal bone of the skull. An occipital lobe and a temporal lobe. Those are the four main lobes of the brain. The cerebrum is also divided into left and right hemispheres. Okay, so you have uh, these lobes on the left and the right side. Your cerebellum is down here below the cerebrum. And then your brain stem consists of the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord. Now, if you'll notice on the, cere uh, on the cerebrum, you have these folds. These folds are also called convolutions. or folds. And basically what happens is the brain grows faster than the skull during development. And so the brain, in order to get as much brain as possible in a small amount of space, it starts to fold in or invaginate on itself and you get an increased surface area. And because of this, you get these defined ridges and valleys. 
The ridges are called the gyrus, and the valleys are called sulcus, these little shallow grooves. If you have a deep groove, we call it a fissure. So that's just your general brain anatomy. You'll go into more detail, actually, when you go into lab. And each part of the brain has a specific function, and we're going to talk in general, uh, generalities on which part of the brain does what. Here we have our cerebrum. I like to say our cerebrum is you, okay? It's the side of your conscious mind. It's your awareness. It's where you perceive senses, uh, vision, sight, smell, taste. Um, it allows you to initiate uh, movement, motor initiation, move your motor, uh, uh, move your arm, move your leg. Allows you to speak, uh, memory, and understanding. So it's you, it's your conscious, conscious mind. Your cerebellum is kind of like a coordinator. It's uh, used to coordinate skeletal muscle movement, uh, motor skills. An example would be like uh, riding a bike, okay? You've got to keep your balance, you've got to pedal the pedals, you've got to do all that all at the same time, and that's got to be coordinated. Or how about catching a baseball? So you see the ball, you've got to put up your arm, you've got to run, you've got to visualize, you've got to catch, all that's got to be coordinated. Your cerebellum helps you coordinate those movements. The last part of the brain, the third section, is called the brain stem. And um, it's kind of the um, automatic part of the brain, okay? Reflexes, breathing rate, things like that, sleep, wake, uh, sleep and wake arousal, kind of the automatic uh, part of the brain. Now the cerebral cortex. When you talk about the cerebral cortex, think about the cerebrum. I'm not a great artist. The outermost layer of any most organ is called the cortex. So the outermost layer of the, cere uh, the cerebrum is the cerebral cortex. And that's where the gray matter is. And what makes it gray are the cell bodies. There's no myelin, there's no not myelinated axons there. So this is where the, the cell bodies are. All right, and the cerebral cortex is divided into left and right hemispheres. The left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. The right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. And we can generally talk about the cerebral cortex having three areas, a motor area, a sensory area, and an association area. Motor means it co uh, controls voluntary movement. Sensory means you're aware of sensations, vision, sight, smell, things like that. And then association areas. That means you're bringing multiple types of sensations together and making a decision. Um, for example, you smell a rose, you think of someone. Um, my great example, if I smell a sweet potatoes, I think of my grandmother. So you have some kind of association where something elicits a memory or a reminder, something like that. You, you elicit some kind of memory due to a sensation. So all your conscious behavior is in the cerebral cortex. Okay, now something that's kind of interesting about the cerebral cortex is it's divided into different areas that are responsible for different things. All right, we have what's called, I like to do two examples, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Basically what happened is back in the early days of physiology and anatomy and physiology, a guy named Broca noticed that some of his patients had uh, problems speaking and upon their death did autopsies and found that there was a lesion or a problem in a particular part of the brain, the same part of the brain with patients who had the same ailment. So what we found out is this part of the brain is associated with communication or language production. So this Broca's area has to do with language production. Okay? Wernicke's area has to do with understanding, language understanding, not only uh, spoken but also written. So this is the ability to speak, okay, and this is where you can understand. And what they found out over time is different areas are associated with different, air, uh, different uh, functions. This is primarily the region for vision, okay, this area here, hearing. You don't have to know this in particular, which area does what, but it's just nice to know that different parts of the brain do different things. That's why if someone has a head injury and maybe they have a, an injury at this area, they may have problems with memory. If they have an area, you know, damage of the brain here, they may have problems with their vision. So uh, damage to certain parts of the brain can damage certain functions. 
Let's talk, talk generally about what goes on in diff, uh, the different lobes. In that cortex, that's where you have your associ association areas, sensory, motor, and association areas. This is what an EEG measures. So when they do an EEG and they want to find out if you're brain dead, that's what they're doing. They're putting an electrode there to measure the activity in that part of the brain. The frontal lobe, that's your personality. That's concentration, uh, coordinates thinking, speech, things like that. Your parietal lobe, speech understanding. You can also use it to interpret uh, size, shape, distances. It coordinates our, our senses. We use the occipital lobe generally for vision. The thing about the occipital lobe, not only can you see, you can think an image. Okay, this part is uh, responsible for that. So if I tell you right now, think of a butterfly, you see a butterfly in your head, and you're thinking that image that you use the visual cortex for that. The temporal lobes are auditory or hearing centers, okay? The ability to think and hear sounds. Again, you can think a sound. If I, if I ring a bell, you'll hear a bell. But if I just say, think of a train whistle, in your head, you'll think of what a train whistle should sound like. So you can think a sound. You don't have to actually hear it. You can just think, of what, think about what it sounds like. All right. Lateralization. I told you that the left side of the brain works on the right side of the body. The right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. So basically, we have these two hemispheres. All right. So if you're looking down on the brain, you have a left and a right hemisphere. Okay. Generally, one side of the brain is dominant or is in more in control. The left side is in control of some things. The right side is in control of other things. And generally, one side of the brain is the more dominant side. In about 90% of the people, the left hemisphere is dominant. The left hemisphere generally controls language, math, and logic. So if you're a sciencey math person, you're a left brain dominant type of person. The right brain, the right hemisphere, is your insight, spatial skills, intuition, artistic. So if you're an artistic person, love to draw, love to play, uh, love to paint, love to interior design, things like that, you may be more right cerebral dominant. So each side of the brain has kind of what it's good at. Most people are left brain dominant. Now these two parts of the brain do communicate. The left and right sides communicate through these little fibers that allow the brain uh, signals to cross over from left side to right side. And you'll see these little brain tracks when you do that in lab. Okay, so we've talked about the cerebrum, this area here. Now we're going to talk about the interbrain, also known as the diencephalon. There's three main sections, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And hopefully you've started learning some vocabulary so you know hypo means below, and epi, like below, epi means upon. So if you can figure out where the thalamus is, you can figure out where the hypothalamus and the epithalamus are. So this is the thalamus, okay? So the hypothalamus is below it, and the epithalamus is upon it or on it, okay? Associated with a hypothalamus is a stalk called the infundibulum, and it connects to the pituitary gland. The epithalamus connects to the pineal gland. Let's talk about what those things do. The thalamus. The thalamus is basically a gateway, okay? I like to think of it as a male sorting center, okay? Information is coming in from all over the body. It all has to pass through the thalamus. The thalamus makes the decision and sorts it to where it needs to go, which part of the brain it needs to go to. So all the afferent or incoming information from all the senses and all the body come through the thalamus. Okay? Now, you also get impulses from the hypothalamus that usually uh, have to do with emotion. And you get in, uh, impulses from the cerebellum having to do with uh, motor coordination. So it's basically a mediator. It brings in all the information and tells it where to go. Like a male sorting center, that's how I think of it. Now the hypothalamus 
you can learn all about in 202. This is going to be a, a large part of what you learn about when you talk about the endocrine system and hormones and things like that. What you need to take away is the hypothalamus is basically in charge of homeostasis. And one thing we tend to say is it's the body's chemist. It is basically monitoring and regulating just about everything. Okay, it's got autonomic or automatic control of a lot of visceral functions. Blood pressure, blood rate, uh, force, and, uh, force and rate of heartbeat, how fast your digestive tract is working. Uh, we use it for emotional responses. We're able to perceive uh, if someone, if they have uh, perceived uh, pleasure or fear or rage, okay, we have this emotional response. It will regulate our body temperature if we're hungry, if we're thirsty, things like that. It helps regulate sleep cycle and it controls the release of hormones. And this is what you're really going to focus on when you get into 202. Um, you have the pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary and the post, the pituitary is divided into anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. So the hypothalamus controls the release of hormones that are made by the anterior pituitary and then it produce, <coughs> produces the hormones that the uh, posterior pituitary releases. And you'll learn about that in 202. So like I said, hypothalamus, very important. Body's chemist, homeostasis, just does a lots and lots of things. Really important part of the brain. Really small, very important. And last but not least, you have the epithalamus. And the main thing I want you to take away from the epithalamus, this is where the pineal gland is. You'll talk about it again in 202. It makes uh, melatonin, not melanin, that has to do with skin and, and uh, skin pigment, melatonin, and we use that to help regulate our sleep-wake cycles. Now, there's a generalized uh, area called the limbic system, or the limbic system, limbic system. And it includes the diencephalon and just parts of the uh, uh, cerebrum. Now, two main areas, the amygdala and the cingulate gyrus. The amygdala allows us to recognize facial expressions, particularly angry and fearful expressions, and that allows us to assess danger. So if I'm looking out in my classroom and y'all have all got this kind of a scared, puzzled look on your face, I can recognize that and go, hmm, they're scared of me, they don't know what's going on, and I, that's that part of my brain that allows me to associate how you're looking at me and what you're, think, what you're thinking, okay? The cingulate gyrus, it plays a role in allowing us to express our emotions, okay? So when you're expressing your emotions, if you're crying, you're frowning, you're smiling, how you express your emotions. It also allows you to resolve mental conflict. Now what I, I think is a neat part about this brain, it allows you to put an emotional response to an odor. Um, think about the, the sense of smell and, you know, why do we even have that? Um, it typically, the response you get is an emotional response. It either smells good or it smells bad. So that's telling you either you want to be near it or it's good for you, it's something you can eat, or stay away, danger, something like that. So it allows us to have an emotional response to a smell. For example, a skunk smells bad. Okay, that's a warning signal to us, stay away. All right, so we react emotionally to things that we smell. So that allows us to, you know, kind of put good, bad, uh, associations to smell. It also allows us to be aware of our emotions. We're allowed to be happy, be sad, things like that. <clears throat> Another area is the hippocampus and the amygdala. And those are involved in memory. We use that part of the brain to associate and make memories. Alright, the brain stem there's three regions of the brain stem. The midbrain, also called the mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Uh, midbrain or mesencephalon, that has to do with reflexes. And in lab, you're going to see the corpora quadrigemina, okay, the four twin bodies, and that allows uh, you to have visual and auditory re uh, relay centers. Um, this is in control of reflex movements. Uh, you turn your head and you hear a sound. So reflex to visual stimulus or uh, uh, auditory stimulus. Your pons primarily is a respiratory center. The medulla oblongata is, oblongata is a reflex center, coughing, sneezing, vomiting, things like that. It also plays a role in cardiovascular, vasomotor, and respiratory uh, centers. 
and it, the medulla oblongata is between the pons and the frame and magnum, that big hole in the skull. So that's where your medulla oblongata is located. Then last but not least, there's a generalized area that encompasses all three parts called the RAS, or the reticular formation. And this is involved, again, in sleep. It allows you to wake up arousal from sleep, kind of an automatic thing. So most of these things here tend to be autonomic or automatic. All right, last part of the brain is the cerebellum. Okay, and this is this area kind of hanging down below the cerebrum and behind the brain stem. It has two, uh, two hemispheres, just like the cerebrum. And it's got what are called folia. Folia means leaf. Okay, so these little leaves, like a page of a book. When you do the sheep brain dissection, you'll see there are these little bitty leaves or thin uh, pages of the cere uh, cerebellum. You have the arbivita, which is basically this white matter. This is the gray matter, and then the arbivita is this white matter. And that means tree of life, arbor vita, tree of life. That's the, the pattern that you see. And the cerebellar peduncles, which is kind of a funny name, cerebellar peduncles. These are tracks that connect the cerebellum to the brain stem. What does the cerebellum do? All right, it calculates the best way to smoothly coordinate a muscle contraction. Okay, remember when I talked about riding a bike? Coordinates movement. So if you have cerebellar process, uh, cerebellar damage, if you have a, a, an injury and, and damage that part of your brain, you may have jerky movements. You may not have a smooth gait when you walk. You may have these jerky, uh, jerky movements. It allows you to recognize and predict a sequence of events during a movement. For example, you're going to catch a baseball. You know that you've got to see the ball, put your arm up, put your hand out, uh, grasp the ball, bring the ball in. You don't close your hand before the ball gets there, okay? We, I, I do, but you, that's not what you want to do. You want to make sure you have the correct sequence of events so that you can catch the ball. It also plays a role in problem solving, word association, things like that. It's kind of your problem solving part of your brain. And that is the end of my lecture. So I hope you guys learned something today. If you have any questions, you always can come ask me or any of your other instructors here at Calhoun. And I hope you have a good day. Thank you.